Hello and good day. This is the Bible Bard. A bard is a storyteller who recites traditional text associated with a particular oral tradition. And I'm here to recite and to amplify what the literature of the Bible says about who is God and who are human beings. Here's the place we're at today. It is difficult for people who are not religious to understand most of the great religions of the world are looking for a Messiah, a great person, usually a man, who comes, saves the world from destruction, institutes their religion worldwide, and brings peace and their kind of morality to human beings. Here's a few, not all, of the well-known religions and their Messiah figures. First, Judaism, which began looking for its Messiah, the Mashiach, in the 6th century BCE, about 3,000 years ago. And there's a branch of Judaism that has another Messiah, that's the Hasidic Judaism, the Chabad Lubavi, looking for the last Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, since the 18th century Christian era. So they've been looking for this fellow, come and be their Messiah for 224 years. Islam is the next one, and they're looking for the Mahdi since the 7th century Christian era, about 1,324 years ago. In Islam, there's a certain cult called Shia Islam. These are the Twelvers, they're also called. And they're looking for the 12th Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi, since 874 CE, about 1150 years ago. There's another branch of Islam, the Ismaili Islam, looking for the Aam or Mahdi since the 8th century Christian era, about 1224 years. And then there's a third branch of Islam called the Ahmadiyya, looking for Mizid Gulam Ahmed. They've been looking for him for 133 years. In Buddhism, they are also looking for a messiah. This is the Maitreya Buddha since the 3rd century BCE, about 2324 years. Hinduism is also looking for Kaaki, the 10th and final avatar of Vishnu since the 5th century Christian era, about 1524 years ago. There's a branch of Hinduism called uh, Vanavisnu or Har Krishna, looking for an avatar of Krishna since the 15th century, about 524 years ago. There's a group called the Sikhs, or the Sikhism. It's the Namhari sect. They're looking for Sagura, an incarnation of the Gua. Gobind Singh since the 19th century Christian era, about 120 years ago. And also there are the Baha'is, and they're looking for Baha'u'llah, the promised one foretold by past religions, since the 19th century, or about 124 years. Christianity also has a Messiah. It's Jesus the Christ, who has been the Messiah for Christianity for the last 2,400 years, not counting the predictions based upon the Hebrew Scriptures 3,000 years before that. This Jesus, the Christ, has already come to earth once and will return a second time in the future. Discussion. There are various ways individuals qualify as a Messiah. Most have to do with performing some miraculous supernatural act that validates their claim. Of course, I'm the Bible bards, so I'm not teaching what other religious scriptures have to declare. The Bible provides verses that serve to qualify who can be the Messiah. Here's not all, but a few of them. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the text says that the Messiah must be a human being born of woman who will crush the serpent's head. The serpent is, of course, a biblical metaphor for Satan or the devil. In Genesis t- chapter 12, verse 3, the text says that Abraham must be the Messiah's ancestor. In Genesis 49, 10, the text adds that The Messiah must be from the line of the tribe of Judah in Israel. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13, the text says that King David must be his ancestor. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, the text states that the Messiah must be a prophet similar to Moses. In Psalm 22, verse 16, the text suggests that the Messiah must be crucified with pierced hands and feet. See the Septuagint translation for clarity. In Psalm 16, verse 10, the text says that the Messiah who dies must not decay after death. In 
Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the text states that the Messiah must be born in the city of Bethlehem. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, the text states that the Messiah's human mother must be a virgin. See the Septuagint translation for clarity. In Isaiah 11, verse 2, the text states that the Holy Spirit of God must empower the speaking of this Messiah. In Isaiah 42, verse 6, the Messiah's ministry must expand beyond the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, the text says that the Messiah must die for the sins of others, not for his own sin. In Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, the text states that Messiah must rule over a kingdom that will never be destroyed. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, the text states that the Messiah must arrive in Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And in Zechariah 11, verses 12 through 13, the Messiah must be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Because of the space, I have not listed the text for all these prophecies about the birth of the Jewish Christian Messiah. It's also important to note that in the Septuagint version of the Hebrew Scriptures, which was produced in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE in Alexandria, Egypt, it was a translation created by 70 Jewish scholars who translated the Hebrew Masoret text into the Greek language. This translation was produced 100 to 200 years before Jesus was born, and it's often seen as a more explicitly messianic than the text of the original Hebrew. For example, the Isaiah 7 verse 14 passage in Hebrew uses the word Alma, young woman, to describe who gives birth to the Messiah. But when the 70 Jewish uh, scholars translated this into Greek, they used the Greek word Parthenos, the Greek for virgin. In their translation, these Jewish scholars apparently thought that the intended meaning of the Masoretic text was not that the Messiah would be born from a young woman, that would not be remarkable, but that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Of course, the Christian and Jewish believers in Jesus, who were scattered across the Roman world, often use the Septuagint as their Bible translation, so some texts listed above are based on the Septuagint more than the Masoretic version. Summary. The Mashiach of traditional Judaism is a single Messiah who is a political leader who will restore Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, gather the Jewish people, and establish global peace. Based on the Hebrew scriptures, the early Christians believed that two messiahs were found in those scriptures. The first one was a righteous person who suffers and dies to save people from their sins and from the judgment of God. This righteous person later is a resurrected person who returns to earth as a conquering supernatural king and imposes his peace and government on the world. So we have one person, but two comings. Most of the messiahs of other religions agree with the Jewish Christian idea of the second messiah, the powerful one. The messiahs of other religions are usually persons with supernatural powers who compel the world to accept their leadership and the government they impose on the nation. What's so interesting about the Jewish Christian messiah is that they must be authenticated not just by supernatural power, but because they pass through all the scriptural gates, I just read some of them to you, required to be genuine. In other words, just because someone has supernatural power doesn't make them the true Messiah. The Bible holds open the idea that a false Messiah could possess supernatural powers, but authentication as the true Messiah sent by God must also meet the requirements of the listed texts, among others, to qualify. If you are an atheist who feels that there currently is insufficient evidence for belief in God and Jesus, you have to explain how many Bible prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus, even though they were made across many generations by many different writers who often did not know each other and whose writings were separated from other writings by hundreds, if not thousands of years. Most unbelievers just won't do that hard work of identifying scriptural prophecies in the biblical text and then verifying when and where Jesus fulfilled them. Judaism itself finds it hard to accept that their own scriptures predict one Messiah but two comings to the earth. One says a suffering servant, 
and once as a conquering king. Other religions listed at the beginning of this podcast find the idea of the need of a Messiah person to die as payment to God for the sins of the world an unnecessary concept. The Bible Bard presents what the Bible teaches about a topic. I'm not trying to convert you to a religion. The Bible Bard podcast is informational. We're talking about what the literature of the Bible actually states, the ideas and concepts it presents, because most people have never engaged with biblical thoughts. Make up your own mind whether you agree or disagree with the Bible's pronouncements. Conclusion, this is the way the Bible Bard works. Brief recitations, closely focused. No distractions, no rabbit trails. Follow the Bible Bard on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Send the Bible Bard any question or remarks you care to offer to BibleBardUS at gmail.com. Glad to hear from you.